is just a quick little recap of what we've covered so far. So in the first week, we looked at the Lean Canvas and that's a really great tool to help break down our idea that we have into our head into a potential business model and start to work through the different sections of thought process, but also action that we need to take. So we also looked at the validation board, another really great tool to make sure that we're focused on making uh, good decisions based on valid information and taking the action to, to learn what's valid and what's not. We want to do that because life is too short to build something that nobody will buy. I should actually have there rather than want. Sometimes they want it, but they won't pay for it. So we will have to make sure that we have a large enough market with willing customers who have both the desire and the capacity to pay. And we need to make sure that we understand who our customer is and what their problem is. And that can often be quite different, even within the one organisation that might be our customer. We might have people who use the product, but other people who make the decision and other people who will pay for it. And we need to make sure we're addressing all of them in, as individuals because they'll all see that problem quite differently. Knowing who your ideal customer is is important as well. So we talked about willingness and capacity to pay, but someone who also cares about the problem and is looking for a solution is really important. And particularly in the early stages, we only have so much time and energy to invest into getting our idea validated and our business off the ground. And we don't want to spend it talking to people who are particularly difficult to convince that they have the problem, ideally where we can find people who know they have the problem and are wanting a solution and potentially even willing to help co-design that solution or give you what you need for you to be able to create a really robust solution is ideal. We looked at the value proposition canvas as another tool that can help us in actually breaking down what is that customer's problem a little bit further into what's the job they're doing and what pain points are they encountering with it, but also what are they looking to achieve or gain from doing that job. And then thinking about our solution and how the different elements of our solution actually marry up to those pain points or gains and the fact that we can't be everything to everybody so we have to be quite selective in how we do that. Making sure that we understand what it is that they're wanting to achieve. We do that as well by utilising a minimum viable product or sorry minimum viable product uh, option where we're not trying to build everything from day one but we are making sure that what we do build is still usable and enjoyable meaningful to our customer, even though it may not actually fulfil the entire suite of what needs to be done eventually. But knowing that uh, it is functional for what we're saying it will do is good, but it has to also be nice to use because it can be functional, but if it's not convenient or nice to use, it probably still won't get the traction we're looking for. <clears throat> we also discussed different business models and the fact that now many, many businesses need to be quite diverse in their business model and have multiple options and no longer can we perhaps just have a bricks and mortar store and that's enough. So looking at the different ways that we can generate uh, revenue and how we offer our services to our customers as well. So thinking about what we sell people but also how we might provide services or generate additional recurring income for our business is also important, as is making sure that we're growing the value of our business in itself. We talked about intellectual property uh, at length last week. Uh, we're talking a bit about brand and market a bit more this week. Uh, product, obviously, around developing that product, but also the systems, culture, and we talked a little bit about funding last week as well, and all of those things help us grow a business that can potentially be sold in the future, because ideally we do want to exit in a positive way, and that's usually through sale uh, as opposed to fail. So when it comes to dealing with our customers and thinking about our systems and processes and strategy, we want to make sure that we're focused not only on getting our customers in the first instance, but also how we retain them and then how we grow them, how we get them to talk about us on our behalf and of course what they'll pay for. And making sure that we have a system in place that helps make sure we don't lose too many of our customers 
without knowing why, helping run through a sales funnel or a process that leads them through the stages of being aware of us and us being aware of them, gathering their interest, making a decision and taking action. And if we're tracking that and we are losing people, we can start to see trends and then address that, whether it is a system problem that we have or perhaps a culture problem or a product problem. And looking at the different ways we can get people involved in that by providing information uh, or something that will be out there for them to access, uh, some way of them starting to engage with us as a sample, being able to then provide that core product, but also thinking about what's next for our customer and what else might they need now that we've solved this initial problem for them. And we'll certainly be looking more at that in the marketing phase as well today. And then beginning with the end in mind on a few different uh, levels, but particularly in regards to our legal conversations, are we setting ourselves up to be able to handle the different things that are going to come along our journey? So what's going to happen when we want to end? Are we preparing our businesses now to be able to do that and do it well, efficiently, um, and also for maximum value? making sure that we're not digging a hole for ourselves unnecessarily by being ignorant of any of the rules that we need to be following and also making sure that our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted when it comes to dealing with our partners and customers. And also acknowledging that there's a lot to think about in that way right at the beginning and sometimes things are not very likely to happen and if they do happen, they're not going to create an impact that's going to uh, alter the course of your business. So perhaps that's not the thing to focus on, but looking for those potential uh, activities or incidents that might come along the way, more likely to happen. And certainly if they happen, they'll create a bigger negative impact generally uh, on your business, making sure that you're well prepared for those. We talked about negotiating last week as well and some of the tips there around how to have those conversations, how to prepare for them, stay calm through them and come out with a win-win solution at the end of the day for you and the other person or organisation. So making sure that you're practising those can be really helpful so that you can feel confident going into any negotiation, negotiating situation. And cash is really important. Um, so making sure that you are considering what is your burn rate, how much is it costing you to operate on a month to month basis, and how long will you last based on the cash that you have left. And if it's not going to be long enough, uh, what can you do about that? And what does it require for you to be able to move to the next stage in terms of potentially raising funds for capital items or operational costs? to see you through, to make sure that you can get to the point of eventually being sustainable, but it might take a little bit of injection of funds to make that happen in the first instance. And then of course, where you can get those funds and what that might look like is something else that we discussed. And there's lots of options there and they may be appropriate for you, uh, but knowing what you need and then working out the most appropriate solution as early as possible is also the thing because Raising money doesn't usually happen in a moment. Um, it takes several moments and sometimes several months for that to uh, go from acknowledging that you need the money to the money being usable in your bank account. So being well planned in advance and considering all of your options and perhaps multiple sources as well. So we've covered quite a bit already and today we're going to jump into our topics for this week. So brand development, marketing and communications. So I'm going to run through these again um, fairly quickly just as a high level overview of some of the thinking points really around these topics and then uh, we'll have a little break and then we'll have some Q&A with our mentors who are here because of their level of experience in these particular, um, <clears throat> these particular topics, but also um, in the sector that we're, we're looking at as well. So give me two seconds to cough and have a drink of water and then I'll get started. It's always different when you're in a place with air conditioning to a place without. So at home, no air conditioning, but a bit cold. Here, air conditioning, but a bit dry. 
So we'll see how we go. Now I will just remind you as well that you're over here and I'm looking at the camera. Uh, so if you do have something to say, please just take yourself off mute and say it. Uh, David's dropping some links into the chat as we go. So if there's anything that I talk about um, that you want some information, you can um, jump in and grab those links. Of course, we share them in our Slack channel as well. But if you do have a question, just take yourself off mute and ask. Um, otherwise, jot down a note uh, to raise that question during the panel session or that topic during the panel session again, because um, if you write it in the chat, I might not see it, but I know David's keeping an eye on it anyway. So we'll jump straight in and uh, go through these three uh, topics again, just at quite a high level uh, for a little introduction to them. So when we're talking about brand development, it's really important to consider that building your brand is not just about the brand of your business, but it's also your personal brand. And now more than ever, your personal brand often uh, is the initial driver of what your business brand will become because everyone is, uh, let's say, quite exposed in terms of our virtual situation that we have. So everything's quite digital, they can see a lot, um, share a lot, uh, and a lot of that translates both from you being a person to being the owner or particularly uh, the founder of a business. So we want to make sure that we're addressing both of those when it comes to brand. So it's really important as well to remember that brand is perception. It doesn't actually um, end with you deciding what your brand is going to be. It ends with the person who's looking at you and listening to you, making up their own mind. Obviously, we want to influence them as well as we can to have them align with what we want our brand to stand for. So when we're doing that, we have to make sure that we understand a lot of that ourselves. So why does our organisation exist? Uh, and it says, why do you exist? You'd have to ask your mum and dad about that, but we're not going to go there today. So why does your organisation exist? What does it stand for? And also, what is the culture of your organisation? So we look at different brands. Sometimes we see some brands as being very you know, trustworthy and honest and um, and, you know, fitting in, in that sort of realm. Um, others being sort of a little bit out there, fun, eccentric. Uh, not to say that they're not both trustworthy and honest and not to say that they're not both fun, but we see them differently. So thinking about how you want to be perceived when people see your brand and think about you is important. Also the fact that it's more than just a logo. Sometimes when people hear people talk about branding, it's like, oh, I need a brand, I need a, a logo. Um, it's so much more than that. So your business name obviously fits in as part of your brand because that's the, the words people will use and often what they will see. But also the product names that you have, the colours and the images and the fonts that you choose to use, the messaging and the language and, and not English versus French, but you know the style of words that you use, uh, the even just the different adjectives that you might use, the energy and the culture and the ethos that comes through everything that you put out into the, the ether um, is definitely part of your brand. And depending on where you're at and what you're doing, the appearance, sound, smell, taste, and feel also can become part of your brand. And we certainly associate that often with things like food, um, you know, Daryl Lee chocolates when you walk past their store, you know, but it extends beyond that. Um, I know I used to stay a lot at the Sofitel and you'd walk into the foyer and it, the smell would hit you and you'd remember where you were. Um, so all of those things are associated with brands and depending on what you're doing, some may be more relevant for you than others. Obviously, if you're developing mining equipment, you might not want to know what it tastes like, um, but yeah, it, it just depends on where you're at. So then comes the importance of developing your brand in terms of your business value. And on the screen there, we've got some fairly significant brands listed and underneath it is the value of the brand, not the value of the company, but the value of the brand within that company's balance sheet. 
And you know, Amazon at $150 billion, Apple at 146 billion, even Facebook at 89 billion. And mind you, these are from 2018, so some of them have changed since then, but still a significant item on their balance sheet. And your brand may or may not ever become a household name, but thinking about what the investment into your brand can become is really important because at the end of the day, when you want to sell your business, are you just selling the, the IP of the, you know, or the patent or, or that, or are you selling the, the organisation and all that it encompasses being how it's known and represented and thought of in the community? So when it comes to yourself, uh, and as well as your company, being known and trusted is very important. So uh, known, liked and trusted is um, generally the phrase uh, that we want to build. And that usually is then what we consider to be our reputation. Do people know us, like us and trust us? Are we reputable? And that generally comes from making sure that we are authentic, both as an individual person and as a company. That can often come through sharing our story and as much as what we sometimes want to share the highlight reel, um, and that is important, sometimes sharing the real story and the things that work and don't work in our business can actually add uh, another layer to our reputation and particularly in regards to honesty when we do something and you know maybe it wasn't the best decision uh, or it didn't go well, acknowledging it and being quite open about that can help our uh, customer and our audience and, and our business colleagues even to understand uh, what happened and, and where we're at on our journey. Also being really um, aware of what you say you're going to do and then doing it is another thing. So we talk about, you know, over-promise, under-deliver, under-promise, over-deliver. So we want to make sure you get that around the right way. And if you say you're going to do something, doing it and doing it consistently. And if it is an exceptional um, thing that you're doing, making sure that it's, it, it is known to be an exception uh, rather than an always, because if it's not part of your always process, people will recognise that and often that results in disappointment and potentially then mistrust. So being consistent uh, as well, and that comes through again in a similar way uh, of, of doing what you say you're going to do, but responding in a similar way to everybody, uh, not just for the people you like, and <laughs> making sure that you are consistent in your response time, in your service delivery, uh, in your product quality, all of those things to, to everyone that you deal with. And then engaging in conversations and that can be online conversations, it can be at a networking event conversations, it can be on a Zoom call conversations, but actually engaging. If people see you but don't hear you, they probably start to wonder why that is. So making sure that your voice is being heard and that your thoughts are, are open and honest uh, in, in what you're saying. Then the other part comes to the fact that it is not only your customers that you're going to want to be known by, but also having really good relationships within your industry and programs like this help you start to meet more people who are operating potentially in the sector that you're in or looking to enter into. And that is beneficial for a whole range of reasons. So one, potential collaborations and partnerships can happen, but also friendships and the personal satisfaction and the energy that you can get. So when we're working with customers all of the time, we often feel that we're on the giving end all of the time. So we have to be on, we have to be, you know, delivering. When we're dealing with our industry, it's not to say that we can stop doing that because we certainly need to, but sometimes we can draw energy from those around us who are in the similar position to us, that are going through the same challenges as us uh, and also seeking potential opportunity, the same as us. So there's a lot more understanding and uh, you know, comprehension of, of the reality of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with other people in our industry. And that can be good for us, both from a business perspective, but also from a, a soul perspective. And the way that we generally find we find those people are things like networking events and industry events, 
field days, but actually going and visiting people in their place of business and meeting them and seeing what they do and, and meeting their team, those types of things can actually add quite a lot to your reputation if you're willing to go out and, and be the one who, who goes to visit as opposed to just wanting everyone maybe to come to you. So keeping all of those things in mind is really important when you're thinking about your brand and how you're perceived. And the final thing I've got there as well is be findable. And this is something that uh, we can often think, oh, yes, I'll do that one day, but I, you know, maybe haven't got there yet. Um, but a minimum expectation nowadays is that you have a LinkedIn profile and that it's up to date and it has your contact details on there of some variety, whether it's a link to your website or you choose to put your email or your phone number, that's up to you. Um, at least people could message you through LinkedIn, but of course you have to keep an eye on that and check um, for messages that are, um, you know, people who, who want to reach out and connect with you in a meaningful way. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I would really encourage you to get onto that. Um, it doesn't take a lot. Um, there's a lot of support materials online. Um, you know, we run little workshops on it all the time. Uh, there's someone who can always help you with it if you don't know how, uh, but generally it's, um, you know, it's expected that you'd have one. So I encourage you to do that as a bit of a task this week if you don't have one already. So the next little topic that I wanted to just chat through again, some high level points on is marketing. And I'm going to be honest, marketing is not my favorite thing to do. I, yeah, just, it's not, <laughs> but it's something that we have to do regardless of whether we like it or not in our business. And particularly if you're in the startup phase and um, you're just, you know, you maybe, or you and one or two other people, it's your job now to do marketing for your business until you can hire someone else to do it for you. So when you're creating any sort of marketing message, I really want you to think about whether it aligns with what you've learned your audience is wanting. So what are those pain points that they have? What are they looking to achieve? What is the job that they're doing? What do they want that end picture to look like for them? And is your message actually talking about them as opposed to just talking about you and what you do and it's not to say you can't do that because you can um, and there's there's value in that as well but make sure it's not just all that that you're really seeing it from your audience's shoes how do they how do they view it and that it, everything that you talk about aligns with that also creating useful content we know how much information is out there on the internet there's you know there's I don't think there's anything that you can search for and not find some content about anymore. Maybe, I don't know what it would be, but nearly anything that you, um, you search in Google, you can, you can find some content. When you create content, obviously you want it to be found. So you want to make sure you're creating things that people are, are looking for or that are going to help them. <clears throat> and you want to put it in such a way that it's going to be engaging. But make sure it's useful. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Also thinking about how your audience likes to, <clears throat> likes to absorb content and likes to absorb information. Sorry, two seconds. All right, so are they readers? You know, do they like to sit down and read a lot of information? Um, do they like to watch perhaps a video or hear the information? Um, do they want a checklist of items to tick off to know this is what I need to do um, or some sort of ebook introduction? Are they also looking for suggestions of where else they might find information? And you don't necessarily have to create everything yourself. You can, you know, link to other people and that's one of the real values of the internet for us now. <clears throat> is to be able to you know share what someone else has created that you totally agree with and you know they've they've written it um, not to say copy it but share it um, acknowledging who created it as well and <clears throat> having content that's interactive is really important as well giving people the option to be able to discuss ask questions um, and engage where you can respond to people's questions when they ask something you can help them by giving them the answer, giving them a link, 
um, you know, being part of a conversation with them that helps them learn what they need to learn on the journey that they're on. So when you're creating that content, we want you to be always thinking, is this valuable for me and valuable for the person who's going to read it? There's lots and lots of platforms, and sorry, I just saw a question pop up, so uh, just give me a second. All right, we might uh, hold that question for our panel session. That is a good one. All righty. So um, when we're talking about platforms, I do want to highlight the fact that I've got a little list there and I realise I'm finding it a bit hard to read today. I must have picked a different colour blue um, on these slides. But uh, it's not all about digital. Um, it's really, really not. Um, there are many, many like digital platforms, but a lot of people still engage in other media. So don't forget about things like um, you know, newspapers, magazines, other publications that come out for your industry, television if it's appropriate, and obviously it can be particularly expensive to have commercials, but there's other ways to engage with your audience if you feel that they're looking on television. Um, events are a great one to be able to get to and share, and that's often where people are out looking for information, looking for introductions. Uh, so, you know, being at events either as a, um, you know, a, a display at the event or a speaker at the event or just an attendee at the event, either can be particularly valuable. And making sure that you're understanding with all of these platforms and different methods of engaging uh, that you're looking to actually communicate again. So you're initiating a conversation, you want someone to engage with you, give them the choice of how to do that and make it as simple as possible. We as humans generally want the easiest possible um, way of doing something. Don't make it difficult. Don't make them type in a really long URL to find you if they've got to type it. You know, give them a, a button to click or if it's in a printed publication, think about how else you can do that. Maybe it's a QR code or a little bitly link or something like that that's going to just make it easy for people or a telephone number you know, just call us. Um, so giving choices is important as well, but it is around initiating conversations and getting that engagement because someone just liking your Facebook page or reading your blog but never engaging with you is still not actually a customer. Um, you wanna learn from them, you wanna be able to talk to them, so invite that um, and give them a suggestion of how to communicate with you and on what topic as well. So a variety of platforms is generally helpful. I mentioned LinkedIn before, definitely for yourself as an individual. Also recommended for your business to have, a, it's effectively a business card on LinkedIn, um, but it makes you findable, particularly if in the early stages and haven't yet developed to the point of having content for a website, it gives something and somewhere for people to find you. And the other thing, and just going back on last week's topic around raising capital, is the fact that you know, people are looking for um, you as a person and to learn a bit about you. So your profile doesn't just have to be, you know, I'm the director of ABC Company. Um, a little bit of personal stuff on your professional profile makes you more human and, and people like that. It also gives them uh, something to talk to you about when they meet you if they have been researching you, if you've, you know, said that you're a fan of, you know, scuba diving or whatever, okay? It gives them a talking point that's not just business and you can look for that in other people as well. So the next part that I'll talk on just for a little bit longer is communication. So that's definitely part of marketing and how we communicate with our customers. In this case, I'm going to focus more around uh, the communication that's a little bit more in terms of pitching. And when you're having the opportunity, and I really did pick the wrong blue this week, um, when you're having the opportunity to, uh, to share your message, you want to be able to do it very efficiently, verbally. You have to be practiced at this. You have to be able to talk. And like I gave you 30 seconds to intro yourself earlier, having that ability or that opportunity and then grasping it and running with it whenever you can is, is really valuable 
So you have to be prepared for that. You've got to have a 30 second intro pitch, an elevator pitch. If you jump in an elevator with somebody, can you communicate what value you provide and what you do in, in 30 seconds? Also thinking a little bit higher level, that high level value proposition where you're really understanding what your audience is doing, what problems they have, what they're looking to achieve and how your product or service marries that up. Can you communicate that in perhaps one, you know, one minute? Then if you're looking to raise investment funds from investors, an investment pitch is an entirely different pitch. Um, it's going to be longer. It's going to have a longer uh, deck of information to go with it. Uh, there's going to be a lot more detail in there about some things, potentially less on others. So making sure that you understand the difference. And then a demonstration or competition pitch. And this is the one we're going to focus a bit more on today because in two weeks time, you'll have the opportunity to do this. And this is where you can present yourself, your organisation, your product or service, uh, your business to the world and, and sharing that. Knowing still that you need a purpose for that and not wanting to waste your time in just talking about something without an ask. So you still want to have a purpose for it and you decide what that is based on where you're at in your business journey and what you're needing at this point in time. So all of those are important, but for today, I just wanted to cover a little bit more on the demonstration pitch. So when you're preparing for your pitch in two weeks time, I strongly suggest that you do prepare ahead of time. And <clears throat> because, <clears throat> excuse me. Because we uh, will still be in a situation of needing to do this in a virtual setting, uh, we will be recommending and uh, we haven't made a final decision yet, but I think it will be, um, the final decision will be a pre-recorded pitch as opposed to a live pitch, just because of the risks of technology challenges and you know fading internet strength. Uh, we don't want you to be, um, you know, Trent got missing, you know, people not being able to understand um, as opposed to hearing Trent pre-recorded. So, so having a pre-recorded pitch, but you still need to prepare and practice. And a lot of these things are, are really important, particularly if you haven't pitched before. And actually, I'm kind of keen, I can't see all of you, but for those I can see, um, have you ever done a live pitch before about your business, like five minutes standing up on stage talking about your business? Yes? No? Okay, so we've got a couple of yeses and a couple of noes, so we're a little bit mixed. So with this, it can sometimes be quite, uh, you know, a lot of anxiety around it for people who've never done it before. So take it as an opportunity to share your message with more people than you normally would in one setting. It's a good thing. But do prepare, and, and I'll highlight that fact many, many times over. Um, preparation is key. The other thing is using as few words as possible. And I am not pitching you at the moment. I'm using lots and lots of words, and I've also got lots of words on my slides because uh, this is not a pitch. This is a content session. Uh, so I suggest try and limit your number of words. Also use words that a 10-year-old would know the meaning of. You don't know who's going to be in the audience. And even if they are people that are from industry and you expect that they're going to understand things, remember that they're hearing you speak about it for the first time. So use simple words that most everybody should understand. Try to avoid using jargon unless you back it up with an explanation of what that word means if you feel that it's really important to use that word. And also don't state any facts as facts unless you've verified them. So don't be Donald Trump or whoever. Um, also practice out loud. Make sure that you can actually say with your mouth what you've written on a piece of paper. Sometimes we can write things and they sound really wonderful in our head, but as soon as we start to speak them out loud, it just doesn't work. Either our mouth can't work that way or the words just don't sound the same. So practice out loud. I recommend you record yourself and practice and then listen back to it to see 
am I, you know, am I getting some, some tone and intonation? Am I excited about it or sad about it or whatever I need to be at that moment? Uh, am I clear? Am I, you know, projecting well? Uh, perhaps I need to slow down a little bit. We can get quite excited sometimes and speak really fast and not put in a breath. So am I actually pausing where appropriate to let the message sink in a little bit? And also where possible, practice saying it to someone who doesn't know a lot about your business already, because the more someone knows about your business, the more they'll fill in the blanks based on what they already know. But this audience that's going to be listening to you doesn't know you. So you want them to get the full story and not be filling in the blanks by something they're just making up or be left wondering at the end, you know, what some of those key points were about. Now, having said that, a little bit of wonder is good because you want them to come talk to you and ask you questions. So you want to make it meaningful enough and inviting enough and interesting enough that someone goes, wow, that was really great. I'd love to know more about X, Y, or Z. Okay, great, come talk to me. That is what we want. But don't leave out big holes of you know, what, uh, what would give context and understanding to somebody so that they want to come and talk to you. So practicing, and again, with someone who doesn't know your business, but someone who also listens well and uh, thinks of what you might be missing is helpful too. So maybe not your dog or something like that. Not, not eventually, maybe first, but not later. So <clears throat> preparation, I'm just gonna say it again. Um, it, it really does, prior preparation prevents poor performance. You can say that with how many P's you want. Um, it, it's critical. Uh, I do suggest writing a script only because when we ad lib, it tends to go off topic or we miss a piece or we take too long or, you know, we, we just don't give it enough uh, information. So if you're not a script writer, that's fine. A dot point, you know, dot point script is okay. You don't have to have every word in there necessarily. But the more you can write, the more you can keep to time, the more you can rehearse and practice and then make it sound more like you. So sometimes when we write a script, we sound a little bit um, not like ourselves. But if you write it and practice it enough, you can edit it and not need to read the script at the time because you'll know it and you will have changed those words and sentences and phrases to be something that sounds like you. You want to make sure that you, again, keep it fairly simple. Don't overcomplicate it. And remember as well that it's not a play. You're not acting it out. Um, but it is good to have a hook. If you think about a story where at the beginning something happens that engages your mind and you want to hear more about it, that's what we want. So you want to engage your audience at the beginning so that they're interested to know how's this going to um, end? How's this going to play out? What's going to come next? Uh, because they're they're involved in the story, but again, it's not it's not a novel. It's not um, you know a fictional fictional novel story. Uh, also, prepare slides to accompany your voice and utilize them as an additional layer of helping someone understand your message, not just your script written out in in lines. You know, basically like what you're seeing on my screen. We don't want to see that from you. What we want to see is a picture or something that represents what you're talking about. So if someone's hearing the words and seeing the picture, they're connecting the dots and comprehending what you're talking about. So a big, you know, a big picture that can describe it is much better than 20 words on, on the screen. You might have one or two keywords is fine. And in some cases, you know, some dot point words are, are really helpful. But just be, yeah, don't be doing what you're seeing here in front of you right now. That's not what we want to see on your slides for your presentation. Uh, I'll say it again, practice, practice, practice. Uh, the more you can know it without having to read it, the better. And also try and keep moving through. Practice allows you to do that. So learning where to put the pause, where to put the emphasis and you'll have a five minute time limit. We can't let you sort of all talk for 20 minutes. Um, so maximum five minutes. Usually recommended no less than four, but if you can cover it in four to five, that's fine. Uh, again, seek some feedback from those inside and outside your industry can be helpful. Just again, from a context perspective. 
And the other really important thing with your pitch is think about what you're asking for. And it doesn't have to be dollars. I don't want to hear you say, I want $250,000 for 5% of my business. Like that's not necessarily what it is. This isn't an investor pitch. This is a demonstration pitch. It's talking about your business and the value proposition that you have, who your audience is. And I'm going to cover some slide suggestions in a moment. Uh, and David's just put a link in there for a example of a demo pitch. Uh, but one of the things that you, you want to get out of this is something that you need. And that could be an introduction. You could be looking for someone to pilot your solution. You could be looking for someone in your supply chain. You could be looking for, you know, an introduction to a particular person in an organisation like the procurement manager or, or, you know, whatever it might be. Let them know. You have to say it. Don't assume that they're going to guess, that they're going to magically just, you know, come up to you and, and tell you what you want if you haven't asked. And then also, uh, if there's something that you need to give in return for that, what is that? So, uh, you know, it might be, you might be looking to run a pilot, it will, you know, be on their site, this is what you're looking for to be able to do, and what will it give them in return? Why would they do that for you? Um, so, it, a, a little win-win situation can be good there. That doesn't always apply for everybody, um, but it just depends on the situation. All right, so uh, just the slides to include pretty much the different um, sections of the uh, lean canvas, uh, usually a good place to start. So what is the problem you're solving? Who's your customer? Um, how are you going to find those customers? Where can you access them? And again, if you need support with that, that could be part of your ask. What is your solution? And again, you don't have to tell them what your secret source is. You want to tell them how the solution helps that person solve that problem um, in, in terms of the value proposition. How big is the market? What are some of the key metrics that apply for you to be viable and to be able to scale your business? So is that market actually big enough for you? Uh, are you looking potentially to go to an international market? What, whatever it might be for you. Um, maybe you're starting and then growing and, and how can you see that happening? What is your strategy to be profitable and sustainable? So how are you moving forward? Again, it could be pilot first, something else. Who's on your team and what strengths and experience are they bringing? Who else is supporting you? So do you have existing customers? Do you have an advisory board? Do you have any investors already? Who's already supporting you with this journey? And again, what are you asking for? Now, you may have mentioned what you're asking for throughout when you come to the relevant section. You don't have to, you can leave it till the end, but you certainly want to reinforce it at the end because people might forget. So be sure to be clear about what you're asking for and then how can they engage with you? So what's your contact details? Some people choose to have their logo and a contact like a Twitter handle or something like that on every slide. So if people are uh, capturing a slide and that's you know often more so when they can't just go back and rewatch the video. Uh, but it, you know it's it's good to be in the habit of doing that if that's something you like. So your logo and and a Twitter handle or a LinkedIn um, URL or something like that on the slide so that if someone's capturing it, it's got your contact details there. But certainly at the end be clear with them about how they can connect with you. What's your preferred method? So that brings me to the end of that uh, introduction to those topics. And uh, as I've gone through, David's shared a few links in the uh, chat and we'll share that with you afterward as well. Uh, we've had our other mentor drop in. So Paul will introduce you in a moment. Uh, and Darren has joined us as well. That's great. Welcome, Darren. We're just going to take a five minute break now. So it's right on 10 o'clock. So uh, five minutes just to uh, grab another coffee, uh, grab a drink of water, whatever you need to do. And then we'll come back and jump into our panel session uh, to discuss those topics in a bit more uh, detail with opinions from those who play in that space more often.